Thank you very much and good morning. I am absolutely delighted to be with uh, AgriPAC and with the Michigan Farm Bureau today. And it's a real honor to be uh, remembered, actually, <laughs> but uh, to be invited back. And uh, those clips that we just saw bring back a lot of memories. And uh, one that I was, I was going to mention, but uh, it's actually it was in the text. But we, we did have a pretty good run in there. And, and I noted that I was referring to a triple play where we had, uh, when I was actually elected, uh, Lou Dodak from Saginaw County, who had an ag background, was Speaker of the House, and Dick Postumus, who uh, is a longtime dear friend. Dick was the Senate Majority Leader, and Dick, uh, I was an Ag Econ graduate from Michigan State. I think Dick was an Ag Econ, but they, they had a different kind of a name for it, I think, later on, but uh, uh, Dick was Actually, uh, we, we had a long history because in 1970, if you can imagine, uh, that long ago, Dick was my campaign manager in my very first campaign for the House of Representatives. I think that was before Jerry Nair was born, actually, in Isabella County. Um, but, uh, and, and one of the secrets to our campaign, even back then, in 1970, running for the House of Representatives, so to all of you who are going through the training program that Farm Bureau set up, which I think is a great idea. Uh, take heart, you, you can win these races. Uh, we won that first one by about 160 votes or so, and it was done by going to, at that time, there were a lot of little uh, gatherings, little Farm Bureau there were community groups out around these counties, and I think we visited every one that we could find in Isabella and Montcalm counties, which was the old district back then, but uh, a lot happened over 20 years. In 1990, the very, very generous introduction captured this so well. It was the uh, AgriPAC introduc introduction of me to the farm community uh, that was so instrumental. And it, it was also just, I saw it in the clip there, when I came back to Farm Bureau to say thank you, I, I indicated it wouldn't have been possible without the support that we had from the Ag Committee, which was truly impressive and and it was absolutely decisive as it turned out in back in 1990. Well let me um, start. I, I set the alarm here so you'll, you'll know it when it goes off. Uh, make sure we get enough time for some uh, questions, get, get things wrapped up in the... Uh, Matt has given me some very uh, specific instructions about what I'm supposed to talk about this morning and uh, I'll, I'll try to stick to the script a little bit but I have that uh, already three or four questions. What's going on uh, with Michelle and where are uh, Maggie, Hannah, and Madeline? So let me just start with the, uh, the update from the Engler family because it, it is impossible for me to think about this, but it's with Governor Snyder having been here yesterday and he's now completing his second term. So that'll be eight years for him. And there were, apparently there was an eight year gap after I left. So uh, that, that's about, <laughs> 15 years or so already, I've been gone. So I've actually been gone from Michigan out of the governor's office longer than the 12 years I was privileged to serve as your governor. So, uh, and when we left, the girls were pretty small. Uh, they did complete uh, their high school and then they completed college last year. I had three graduations. Michelle and I were busy in the spring. We went April, May, and June. So we had, Hannah really kind of went off the rails and went to the University of Michigan. I, I have to, I'm sorry about that, but uh, I, you know, she's an English major and she's working in New York City now for Doubleday, a publishing company, and loves what she's doing. Um, Madeline went to William & Mary, which is in Virginia, and she's a history major. And she's, um, well, she's in California with her sister, and that sister is Maggie, and Maggie went to Stanford, and her degree is electrical engineering. You can imagine which of the three had the best job prospects. Uh, and uh, Maggie was doing well enough that she talked Madeline and moving out to uh, California and for a year and living with her. So th they're out in San Mateo and Maggie's working for a, a startup company and doing something in the cybersecurity world. Um, programming, I, there's a programming language called Python. Somebody may hear, may know about it. I know very little. But I said to her, she was doing some homework. She's now also, of the three, she's the only one who's taking some grad school courses. <clears throat> and uh, 
she was working on something over Thanksgiving, a page full of numbers, and I said, well, are you, are you working in Python? She said, no, I'm working in R. <laughs> R, okay. So I quickly Googled that, that, what's the difference between Python and R in terms of languages? And it said R is preferred by those who are trying to do more uh, robust data visualization. And so I walked back into the room in a little bit. And I said, well, Maggie, you really think R is that much better for data visualization than uh, <laughs> Python? <laughs> she said, you've been Googling again. <laughs> I didn't actually fool her very much. But uh, they're doing well. Uh, Michelle is great. Her parents, uh, as you know, she's from Texas. And her parents are down in San Antonio. They both have had some health issues. So we've been spending a little more time there. But um, life is... Uh, is busy. I stepped down from the business roundtable um, this year <clears throat> after six years of heading that uh, association. Uh, our major priority was tax reform and now it looks like we're going to see that come across the finish line. More on that in a little bit perhaps. Uh, prior to that I had spent over six years running the National Association of Manufacturers. So I've, I've tried to uh, keep busy and uh, uh, near the in that last couple of well, last year and a half or so, actually had a chance to work a little bit with Zippy Duvall on some of the tax issues because we were trying to make sure, we, we felt if we could get the business roundtable and the manufacturers and the Farm Bureau together, we'd have a pretty potent coalition. And we were, we were I think, quite aligned in terms of what we thought ought to be in a comprehensive tax bill. And I, I'm very pleased that the Senate has now got a bill out of committee. I, I think we're gonna get tax reform done um, and the American Farm Bureau will deserve uh, credit. They played a pretty potent role in this. Uh, it's going to have to get across the line, but I, it looks to me like both in the House and the Senate we're on, we're on track to get there. Now, a lot, of, a lot of distance to go before we get that across the line. One of the things that Matt had, had suggested I, I give you a little bit of an update on or kind of... Um, uh, maybe a little background, and I think it is applicable given the uh, AgriPAC presentation that we had just a little bit ago about some of the trading you're doing, about some of the fundraising you're doing. Uh, because when I, I started out in Isabella County, and there, and I, it's been so long ago that, that I know there are people in here who weren't born when I was elected, I guess, but, uh, uh, and I know that some of you were pretty young because I had a young man come up to me and said, well, I remember being up there and you put me up on your shoulders when you were speaking. Okay, I'm older. <laughs> you know. But uh, I, uh, growing up on a cattle farm uh, in, in central Michigan, uh, you know, I had a dad who'd been very active in uh, agriculture issues and education issues. Tony, you remember the school board. I sort of came by it maybe through, through that, never really had expected to run but went into the legislature, never expected to stay, but along the way, ended up in a lot of races where, uh, you know, I had incumbents, beat an incumbent to get elected, beat an incumbent in redistricting to stay in the House, and then uh, beat an incumbent to move to the Senate, and then um, had the privilege of being the Senate leader for about seven years uh, as a majority leader, a majority that uh, has been maintained ever since 1984 when it was first achieved. So that's a pretty interesting record, although I've uh, kidded both Dick Postumus and now the Senate leader, Arlen Mikoff, I said, who would have imagined that there'd ever be a, a 27 to 11 majority in the Michigan Senate, which is what the current numbers are. I spent seven years with a 20 to 18 majority. And I always said in Washington when people talked about your background, I said, well, I, I learned to count when I was a Senate leader with a 20 to 18 majority, you couldn't lose anybody. So I, you know, McConnell in the Senate, he's got two votes to spare, uh, uh, but um, it's not easy. But it was good training and good background for uh, serving as governor and trying to negotiate then on an array of issues, uh, both across party lines and uh, among the different uh, viewpoints in the party. And uh, those different viewpoints have been there forever. I think uh, today's environment brings out those differences in a bit more stark contrast, but uh, needless to say there are uh, almost as many differences uh, among 
Republicans in Washington, um, as there are certainly there are a lot of differences among Democrats, and there's a big wide gulf now between the two parties there, and it seems less and less that there's an opportunity where they can ever work together. One of the things that we did in Michigan, I thought reasonably well, was be able to build some coalitions and get some things done. Part of it was made easier by the fact that uh, there were people like Lou Dodak who were in positions where they were interested in things like agriculture. And I think we look back on our time and we can say with considerable pride that we, I think, brought a great deal more equity to the funding among universities, but at the same time, we also were, were very much aware of, I, I had made this a priority as a Senate leader, and we also, I should mention that a key ally just passed away in the last couple of years, but Senator Harry Gast, who chaired the Appropriations Committee for all those years uh, out of Berrien County, Harry had a very keen interest in uh, Michigan agriculture as well, but we we were we were um, making it a priority always, and as a Senate leader and then as governor, to uh, support both uh, the basic research at the ex at the extension at the um, at Michigan State through the experiment stations and expanded in those days the number of experiment stations to cover a bit more of the diversity of agriculture in Michigan, and at the same time. Uh, were supportive of the Cooperative Extension Service. In fact, my first paying job um, really were, I, other than you know, getting paid for doing things around farm, was, was working two summers when I was at Michigan State for uh, the Extension Service. One, one summer I got to inspect every vegetable garden of a 4 H'er in the county of Isabella. And, and then a great experience, I guess, my, my dad and his cousin Originally, the, the Engler farm was the Engler brothers, but the brothers would be my grandfather and his brother. Uh, but when it came down, there was one son in each of those families, and they decided, uh, uh, you know, the, the smart ones, Francis and his family, went the dairy business, and then uh, my dad uh, went to the beef cattle business. Later on, as that summer employee of the extension service, the, the, the dairy inspector quit, and so I, I got tabbed with the going out and doing the milk samples, uh, which brought me into every uh, dairy barn in the county. Uh, and I learned that people actually milk cows at 4.30 in the morning in one instance. Uh, I thought that was a little early, but, um, <laughs> the, and I, I had a chance to be in some pretty nice milking parlors. Uh, and those were early day milking parlors, very different than what we have today. And I had a chance to be in some barns that were, um, dubious, uh, I'll say, but um, I, it gave me a great experience, also confirmed why my dad probably had chosen the cattle business rather than the dairy business. Uh, but uh, as, as a believer in the role of uh, the university, and I've often cited the fact that one of the great things that was done in the mid-1800s was the Morrill Act and the establishment of the land-grant universities. And, the nation's premier land grant university, Michigan State University, strikes me as a, uh, as a, as a great example of how um, a public investment can result in a great impact and benefit for the public at large. And I think we've seen that with food production, not just here, but, but as a nation. And when I look at today, uh, the importance of agriculture, I look at some of the trends, um, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating time with the population growth in the world, with the, I think exports in the U.S. were 140 billion or more last year. Um, it, it's one of the reasons that I've been concerned about some of the trade policies that are being talked about right now. We, we always are interested in opening opportunities, and I think Governor Sonny Perdue is a terrific choice to head the Department of Agriculture. I knew Sonny when he was governor down in Georgia. Uh, a s solid guy and, and not, a, not at all uh, reluctant to speak out on behalf of agriculture and to defend keeping uh, the doors and the windows open for trade across the globe. And Michigan being an important ag exporting state, uh, this, this matters here, it matters everywhere in the country, it seems to me, for the, for the ag community. So, uh, and that's gonna continue to be a very I think important part of 
of the agricultural economy, but indeed of the U.S. economy itself. Um, the other thing that um, I wanted to sort of dwell on before my, my alarm goes off here and we open it up for questions is the, the impact that um, the Farm Bureau policymaking at the grassroots can have, because today uh, with term limits, which I think uh, regrettably has, has really weakened the legislative branch, and I think it's weakened government in, in general in many ways, but the difficulty today is it's hard to have the kind of experts on whether it's transportation policy or education policy, welfare policy, or ag policy. And so it becomes more in, uh, important for the grassroots activities that you're engaging in. And that, that's everything from recruiting candidates and actually having members run for office. The good thing is if you run now, you don't have to look at it as being a career. It can't be. It's only six years in the House. So um, you're only gone for a little bit of time. Um, but we, we really, we, we've got to have that level of involvement because people who get there often don't have much background. Now, I know I mentioned Jerry Nyer before. Jerry's from Isabella County. Isabella County elected Roger Houck. Roger comes from an ag background. He wasn't working anymore on a farm, but he certainly comes from a background where he has some knowledge and understanding. But fewer and fewer of those are uh, situation when Dick Postumus was lieutenant governor, you've got two ag econ guys as governor and lieutenant governor. Ag was pretty well looked out for. Uh, governor Snyder, I think, has done a good job for agriculture. Uh, I heard he got a good reception yesterday, but it, it doesn't come natural to a guy from the University of Michigan, I have to say. I'm just saying. I mean, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, but th he does. Think how smart he is. He's got Dick Postumus as his chief of staff now, so I figure we're being looked out for. Uh, but the the leadership in the Senate, Arlen Meekoff comes from Ottawa County, so that's an important ag county, and Ottawa was recognized this morning. And in that little clip that showed up on the screen, Ottawa County was the county I singled out because in 1990, uh, I think we we garnered almost 80% or more of the vote in that county, so that was pretty decisive as well. But we, we really have got to continue to tell our story. And the one of the things I'm excited about in Washington today is that you know, when you get beyond all of the noise and the commotion, the, uh, um, really in the, uh, the uh, acting out at times of uh, all, all, all over the place down there, there are a lot of very solid fundamental policies being advanced. And I, I think especially in, I, was, I heard Scott Pruitt w had hoped to be here. I, I think that's an example of a terrific appointment coming from Oklahoma where he'd been attorney general, been very interested in things like everything from property rights to um, uh, simply, I mean, he, he does believe in a right to farm. And he does believe that regulatory takings are a problem, and he believes that overregulation is a problem, and so I think we're getting much more reasonable um, decision making taking place at the agency level. We've seen Congress, uh, through the use of the Congressional Review Act, which prior to uh, January 20th of this year had been used one time in its 20-year existence, and I think now they probably have. Um, I've lost track. It's 15 or 16 successful uses of that act to remove legislative, uh, to remove regulations from the books, often regulations that had been promulgated by agencies in defiance of what was in the original law. And um, I, I think it's, um, it's awfully important. It's, and those have been mostly done on a party line vote. There just hasn't been support. And it has been interesting. This has been a series of votes which has really exposed the sort of the the philosophy of some of the members of Congress who, because both houses have to vote on these, so you get a chance to see everybody's vote. Um, one that is of particular importance to me was the, that whole uh, Waters of America uh, regulatory scheme that the previous administration in Washington had been uh, pursuing at the EPA where their, their definite, navigable was disappearing from the, from the law and it was basically, uh, you know, we were into mud puddle regulation almost, uh, but um, 
never really was a, the intent of Congress and never could Congress, had that been the expressed uh, intention of the proponents, they wouldn't have passed that legislation. So EPA went far, far afield on that. And yet you had people in both parties telling you how, oh, we're very concerned about that. Yes, you, you do have a problem. Well, the case that went to the Supreme Court that was so important actually came from Midland County. It was the Rapanos case. And um, in that case, a very, I knew John Rapanos when he was alive, very stubborn individual. But when he believed in something, he was ready to fight for it. And, and he fought back against the determination that a, a wet area of his field had somehow become a, a wetland and therefore uh, subject to uh, federal EPA oversight. And he won that case in the US Supreme Court. Well, then they tried through regulation to come around the back door and re-regulate uh, this. And Congress quashed that with this Congressional Review Act and removal of that regulation. And pretty much a party line vote on that, even though I, I su suggest that across the country, we had members in both parties telling constituents, oh, yes, that's unreasonable. We should do something about it. Well, when they had a chance to do something about it, you can see how people voted. That's, that's just one example where when people suddenly have to vote on something, uh, you find out what they really believe. I think it's going to be somewhat the case with tax reform. I said come back to that because I think tax reform for the nation, it is the one thing that at the Business Roundtable as we brought economists in and got reports done, we're, we were convinced if you wanted to add a full percentage point or more to GDP growth in the US, tax reform was the way to do it. And it was a, a really important for businesses, be they incorporated or unincorporated pass-through entities. We, we needed to deal with the whole situation. And that, frankly, was, uh, it, it's always nice on the individual rates to do something. And, certainly recognize that pass-through entities pay on individual rates, but we, we felt that there was a way to take care of pass-throughs um, even apart from getting at the individual rate if you, if you had to. But we knew that business tax relief was what was going to be the engine that uh, really powered the U.S. economy. The idea that we've got somewhere in the range of $3 trillion, and that's give or take. I heard the president say $4 trillion this week. I, seems a little high to me, but it's, it's a big number of cash trapped offshore because of the way U.S. Uh, tax policy is today. The fact that we've had companies headquartered here uh, suddenly acquire a smaller foreign uh, partner and then relocate headquarters just to change their tax uh, headquarters it seems to me to be silly. And we had the highest, have still, the highest um, corporate tax rate of the major industrial nations in the world. So that all needed to change. And when it changes, I think it's gonna be good for growth in the US. Um, and I believe, as I said earlier, that this is gonna get done. I think the Republican majorities in the House and the Senate realize they've got to complete this work. Um, and I do think when it's done, that groups like the American Farm Bureau are gonna be able to look at that and say, hey, we made a difference. We do not have any votes for tax reform in the Michigan Senate delegation. We have two no votes, but I think that, um, and I don't think there'll be, I think there will be yes votes among Democrats when the bill finally gets to the final vote, but I don't think there'll be any from Michigan. Uh, that's too bad because I think uh, among states it could benefit the most. Michigan probably is one of those with the, the major, both global companies that are headquartered here and the importance of sort of Michigan in, in terms of its um, sales that we of products we make here and sell uh, around the world. But I want to I want to see that get done. Another issue that I, I'm not sure where the Michigan Farm Bureau is on this, but um, and I'd be interested maybe even in the questions and getting some feedback. But it does seem to me that um, we, we can't uh, stop working on trying to find a solution for the immigration issue and problem because the labor shortages in parts of agriculture in parts of the country are pretty severe. And there are, um, there, there's no question there are certain crops, certain commodities where um, there just doesn't seem to be enough of a workforce here to do that work. And 
uh, while mechanization has dealt with a lot of it, there still is a need for, for labor and um, robots in the future won't be able to do all this work and, and machines probably can't do it as well. So, and, and I don't think we're gonna find uh, you know, sons and daughters of Michigan or any other state in some cases uh, willing to come and be, be employed on somebody's farm to do it. But I, but I am curious what your, your thoughts are on, on that. Let me just try to close in a, in a timely fashion here with the, and open this up. I, I do think that um, the opportunity for um, rural leadership is, is ripe. I think there's, there's a great potential in it. It strikes me that when people run for office today, uh, the first thing they need is a small cadre of support. You, you gotta have a few people around you who are willing to help you and uh, it's a natural for an organization like this, which is spread out geographically uh, well positioned to be able to help in, in county after county and sometimes that'll be enough. And many times we're seeing in these open seats now, a, a cast of characters get in and so um, it, it doesn't take 40% of the vote to win a primary. Uh, we've seen people win primaries with 20% and then go on to serve six years. So don't, don't, rule this, don't rule this out. Don't rule out getting directly involved. And um, it's also important to think about things like uh, the upcoming election in 2018. We'll have two trustees up at Michigan State University. I happen to think that, you know, we get a lot of credit at Michigan State for the fact that you've had this longevity, only, what, two or three you know, coaches in basketball, D'Antonio's one of the longest serving coaches in the country and as a head coach. As they say, a sports program, great stability. Well, guess where else we've had stability? In the presidency at Michigan State with Peter McPherson's tenure followed by Luanna Simon. Well, uh, I, I want Luanna to serve forever. I tell her she needs to be president for life. I think she's done a good job, but the trustees matter there. And the two trustees that are up this time, when I was governor, we tried to make sure that we had a Tom Reed or a Don Nugent or Republican uh, nominees who reflected the ag community, at least one of those eight trustees ought to have a familiarity with this important um, community and with the important role that exists between uh, Michigan State and the, the ag community. If that's lost, I, I worry about what happens inside the university in budget fights, I worry about the priority that agriculture might have when it comes even going to legislature uh, seeking support. So, so this time around, we, we need to be aware of what those um, uh, choices are. And I've been told that uh, Brian Breslin, who's a member of the board, has decided he's not gonna seek reelection. So that means there's somebody new gonna be nominated. And I don't know if we've got that candidate in this room, but uh, we, ought to be, we ought to be thinking about that. My other candidate, if he could be persuaded, since he, he, he said he'd stay to Governor Snyder at the end of his term, but why not Dick Postumus running for the MSU Board of Trustees? He'd do a really good job and he could represent uh, the agriculture community. So I, I think there's nothing that substitutes for having really good candidates for when there are opportunities to elect them. And so um, I think that's, um, that's just something to keep in mind and that's a role also uh, and the, the other reality of political uh, voting behavior is that those, those elections of these trustees and regents, they're down the ballot. And so there's a big fall off. People who vote for the governor's race or the Senate race or even Congress, state legislature, but then they fall off. They don't vote for some of these. They don't vote for some of the court seats. And we've got court vacancies also, and that's, Michigan, one of the things that probably lasted the longest and has it even survived the Granholm years is the quality of the Michigan Supreme Court. It's a tremendous court recognized around the country as a true rule of law court. Well, we've lost stalwarts like Bob Young who've retired, um, although I think he's got a greater calling, so I'm, I'm happy about that, but, uh, but Bob Young, now Joan Larson just was appointed uh, by President Trump to the uh, Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, so there's a vacancy there. We're gonna have three or four seats on the Supreme Court that are in this election. And, and believe me, there is, we're, oh, there's my alarm. 
pretty good. <laughs> um, I, uh, Michelle loves that alarm. Not so much, but <laughs> um, that, uh, anyway, the, the, so these court seats are up. That's a nonpartisan part of the ballot, so you even have to go over and vote for them separately. And again, uh, there's a force multiplier when you've got something like the Farm Bureau, because if every Farm Bureau member remembers to vote and encourages everybody they can influence to vote for these down ballot board of trustees spots and the nonpartisan Supreme Court, uh, you can have your votes actually worth about two every vote you cast because there's that big of a fall off. Well, let me, um, I, I met, one of the things he implored me is don't, don't run the clock out, leave time for questions. So I will, that was the alarm to say, hey, take some questions. So, because I could just keep chattering away up here, but uh, I think it'd be more fun to kind of hear from you. So I don't know if there's a roving mic out there or somebody's going to shout really loud or how we're going to do this. And it's a little hard to see the hands. So, uh, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I can come oh, we have, oh, we have we have a man here with cards. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Thank you again, Governor. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. We, um, thanks for coming and sharing your perspective and your story. Uh, we do have a couple of questions uh, that we've been collecting from the audience. And the first one would be, what advice would you give farmers who are in this audience that might be prospective candidates? Um, organize, start early. Uh, the, the, the networks are really important. I, I think that one thing that we saw in the national campaigns is that um, the, the ability to reach neighbors and reach people who are like-minded in your own community really, really important. The, the, the public, I think, remains um, unhappy, very unhappy about sort of the state of politics. There's, and and this, is, this is a time of unrest. And so uh, I think getting out there and being sincere about what it is your, what motivates you to run, that you want to go to make a difference, and here's what I'm going to do, and not be, uh, I think, be genuine. I mean, I, I, I will say I did not expect Donald Trump to win the nomination in the Republican Party, um, but once he was the nominee against Hillary Clinton, I, always, I was telling people that, uh, based on my experience here in Michigan, I, I thought he could carry Michigan. I wasn't sure he would. I, I was shocked that he carried Wisconsin uh, and came very close, even in places like Minnesota, but but he had a he clearly had a message and and the message was about change and authenticity uh, even though uh, part of that was a bit jarring in the way it was presented and the way he presents himself but it was very clear to the electorate if you want change he's the only one's going to give it to you you want to stay the same and I, I thought you know uh, Mike's point, you had Mike was there up, up on the screen there talking about what AGPAC can do and about if you don't get involved, who else, somebody else is going to do it. Well, you don't want to leave it to somebody else. You want to get involved. So I, I start early and, and work off your own network. You start with that. You start from strength and, and build out. And you've got to get people involved. And the word of mouth is much stronger than I, the advertising, I think, matters almost not at all. I mean, it's still there. That's why even this U.S. Senate race where um, I'm, I'm very keen on Bob Young, they said, well, you know, he doesn't have a lot of money and the incumbent Senator Stabenow, she's got lots of money. It doesn't matter. I mean, somebody's for change and somebody's not. You won't be the person that's for change. Thank you. After 20 years of Michigan term limits, please share your thoughts on how you feel it is working. <laughs> <laughs> My thoughts are that it's working poorly. Um, I think six years is too uh, limited for the House of Representatives. I, I'm sort of, uh, maybe because I had to work my way up, but also I started pretty young, so that probably is to be expected. But today you can start very young and you walk in the door and think, can I be speaker? Um, 
we, we just need to have, if, and if we're going to keep term limits, then let's at least have a fixed period of time, let people spend it all in the House or all in the Senate or some combination thereof, but let's not, I mean, I, I'd be happy if somebody could spend, if, if it were 16 years and you could spend it, you know, eight in the House and eight in the Senate, that'd be fine, or all 16 in the House. I, I, I think we need to spread this out a little bit more. We're losing a third of the House every year or something like that, or every election. And it just doesn't give us enough stability. And um, that, that, that deprives you, I think, of having expertise working for you. And people say, well, you know, that's okay. The, the, the Farm Bureau lobbyist or the lobbyist for X, could, they, they can fill in. It, it's, it's too hard because people don't, they, they don't even, we got people get elected, they don't even know what a mill is. What, what, what do you mean by a, what's a mill? Or they don't know how roads are funded. Uh, they don't get the, you know, the complexity of Medicaid funding. And by the time they learn that, they're leaving. And so I, I would say stretch it out a little bit more. Senate works a little better in the House because they've all got, at least most of them got six years experience before they get there. Thank you. What policy advice would you give the future governor? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I, I think that um, the one thing that, we have got to get right. And I don't know, how many school board members do we have out here? We must have a few. See, I, I, I'm wondering in, in your respective schools and in Michigan schools, I, Betsy DeVos talked me into chairing the National Assessment Governing Board. That's the body that administers the NAEP test, the reading and writing test at the fourth grade, eighth grade, and 12th grade. In America today, 36% of our young people at the fourth grade are proficient in reading, 36%. So one in three. I, I believe that we can do a better job than that. I think America can teach its kids to read. And, and proficient is, is the important part there. I mean, you're, you're actually reading a paragraph. You can answer a couple of questions about it. This is not high stakes testing. This is just, can you read and do you understand what you've just read? And, and we need, and it's, it's, Detroit's 5%, one in 20. Think about it this way, do this math. Uh, we spend more than 15,000 a student in Detroit. Classes are probably bigger than 20, but if we use 20 as the number and use 15,000, then we're spending three, or the revenue is 300,000 for that classroom of 20. And four years of school, kindergarten, first, second, and third, so that's 1.2 million. For 1.2 million, we get one child reading proficiently? I, I think we can do better. So I, I, I really am stressing the idea that we've, we've got to get this right because otherwise I, I think we, we, we have a great risk of, of, of just not being uh, competitive. And that this is something where I, I think it's really, really important. The other is to keep your eye on the economy. I mean, it's all about, uh, we were pretty, pretty focused on the idea. It's all about jobs. And, Jobs come from entrepreneurs, whether they're in agriculture, small business, or major corporations. So what's it take to make Michigan the most competitive? Thank you. So this one's near and dear to my heart. You talked about immigration a little bit. Share your thoughts on a guest worker program. Well, I, I'd, I'd love to have a legal guest worker program. I mean, that's actually probably what worked many years back. But there's got to be a way, and we probably ought to make it easier for people to come here, do work, and go home. Um, not moving away from agriculture, I take the Grand Hotel. Everybody knows about the Grand Hotel. Most of us have been there on occasion. I mean, there have been Jamaican families. We're in fourth generation probably of some of the families have come there, worked the season, and then gone home. Um, after 9-11, there was a, as you recall, there was a mess with, you know, trying to get people in the country. And um, the Grand Hotel went through a real crisis that season, that first season especially, because they couldn't get anybody to work. Nobody wanted to come up there beyond the island for the summer, and they would hire people, they'd come up, maybe work one pay period, and they were out of there. This is too hard. Uh, you, you're expecting what? You know, and they, they, you, you just could not, they couldn't staff the place, and they couldn't get their traditional staff in. Um, gosh, I, I think they ought to be allowed to have that kind of a program. Um, one of the challenges we've gotten, this is why that education answer a moment ago, we, 
there, there are an awful lot of jobs in today's economy that are blue tech, and I guess if I were to elaborate on the education answer, uh, we need to get back to a lot more career and technical education. I wish, I wish we had been uh, pushing that harder and longer right from the very beginning, because that there was a lot more of that back then, but it's, it's changed so much, and this, this needs to be there. Not everybody needs to go to college, but everybody's got to have skills in order to be able to do jobs, and then they're going to be uh, employable and support their family. But I, I would argue that um, no matter what we do uh, for, your, for the dairy industry out here, it's pretty hard to go talk somebody into working in the, you know, getting up at 4.30 every morning to milk those cows with you. Um, and where we... We, we, need the, we need the labor, and we need it in the construction industry, parts of that. Um, and, and so I think a, the right kind of a program with the right protections, this is not, I don't want to take jobs away from you know, American workers, but today we've got unemployment rates that are very low, and we've got work that needs to be done, and we've got crops that can't be harvested or buildings that can't be built because we're lacking labor. Should the DEQ have an oversight commission similar to the Department of Ag and the Department of Natural Resources? Um, I, I would say no, but uh, um, because I, I don't, um, I think ultimately the governor has to be responsible for picking the right individual to run these departments. And when that's done right, um, it works. When they put the wrong person in, it doesn't. Um, was I thought Dan Wyant was a great ag commissioner during my time. Would Dan have been a good ag commissioner without the ag commission? Probably he would have. I I do think, uh, and I there's a point. So well, how does how does industry? How do the voices get heard? Um, I, I think there are. I think the chief executive really matters here. Um, you, you you've got to have an individual in that front office who's aware of the industry, supportive of the goals. Because today, I'll use ag as an example, but um, it, it is, you know, does one ag voice, let's say if we had a DE commission, we might have one from agriculture on there. You might have three environmentalists on there as well. You might have, I mean, it, you know, is it better? You want to make sure your voices are heard, that somebody can have the input, but I'm not sure the commission guarantees that. Uh, and it certainly doesn't guarantee it as well as having the right governor in office making the, the appointment of the right individuals. Thank you. We'll end with this. History. Please comment on the landmark property tax reform when voters approved Proposal A in 1994. Well, uh, we, we thought it was pretty good. It stood the test of time in, in many respects. Uh, it certainly, uh, we worked, that, that was... A lot of work to get the, uh, the the levels, the millage levels low. Um, it, it impacted uh, you know much more than uh, than agriculture. We we thought there were some guarantees for agriculture. I realized at the time we were trying to, um, you know, there was I guess there was you might say there would be tension with the uh, the agreements to keep land in ag production in return for having low property taxes over a period of time and all of a sudden we're we're taking these property taxes down to you know six mills um it was a it was a big deal but uh it, it brought us a great deal of equity in the way we finance education um, i think that it's also brought us the opportunity for uh parents and uh students to have some choices that they didn't have and I think uh, part of what we, we want to do, I, I always said it was never our policy to fiddle around with mascots. I, and I, this is truly coming from a small rural school district where for years the policy at the state level been try to you know, eradicate the Beale City School District and merge it with something else. I never thought forced merging, or merging of school districts was the answer, but I did think competition among schools we, we would not accept an assignment to, uh, I grew up in Isabel County, so should I have had to go to Central Michigan University because it's right there? Uh, well, I wanted to choose, to, I chose, the only school I applied to was Michigan State. Um, 
we, we let people have choices, but three months earlier, historically, you had no choice. If, you're, if your land was here, uh, this is where you went. In fact, we had the oddity, our farm was next to the Murphy farm. The, the school bus for the Mount Pleasant School District turned around our yard. So, I, you know, could have gotten on that one just as easily as the one to be able to see. Um, in those days, that was not permissible. Today, it would be. And so I think uh, having schools uh, provide what is needed for their community, and if they, that means they attract students from next door, that's fine. And, and all of that was also part of Proposal A. It wasn't just millage rates, but um, I, I think that, um, and Detroit, it's, it's interesting, the Renaissance is part of what's happening in Detroit. I mean, a lot of new housing being built there. People forget, before Proposal A, the property tax millage in Detroit was 60, getting close to 60, it was 60 some mills for education because the, the electorate just kept voting more mills. Nobody would build, today at six, no one would build houses there at, if it were being taxed at 60 mills. Uh, so none of this that's happening today would have been possible without Proposal A. So I, I actually think it's, it's worked pretty well. What has not worked as well is that the increased investment in public education has not resulted in dramatically better outcomes. And that's, that's the challenge again for, that, for the next administration. We just have to do better. And I truly believe the state with the best schools wins. So we ought to be thinking about how do we, what's it take to have the best schools? How do we do ag education, for example? I mean, today there are, there are strategies, I think, where we could do online aspects of ag education that would be very powerful. And we could take them all over the state. You wouldn't be dependent on having the, you know, in your district, the quality ag teacher. And next door, they have a bad ag teacher. You could have you could have the best programming available and it's really agri-science today. So how do, you, how do you make that all relevant? And so I think there's some real opportunities. Um, and I think Proposal A created a system where there's great flexibility for, um, for his parents and students and uh, I think some significant protection for the property owners themselves. And we certainly ended the idea that grandma had to sell her house uh, because she couldn't afford to pay the property taxes and literally when we were doing Proposal A, we had those stories being presented to us where somebody was being taxed right out of their home and the homestead protection that was in Proposal A really changed all that. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much for bringing me back and letting me spend some time with you today. It's fun to see everyone and, uh, and meet probably the sons and daughters of the people who actually could vote for me and support me. You're all so young compared to me. So thank you very much. I got a gift for you. you. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> How young is you, that? You mean a lot to this crowd. That's very young. <laughs> well, Governor, as a, as a small token of our appreciation, we have a picture of you addressing this delegate body in 1990, weeks after your election and it is framed in some barn lumber from Michigan. Excellent, so very much. good. Young guy here, very young guy. <laughs> Thank you.